The first measure we're going to be looking at is encryption, and this is the process of making data secret so that only the authorised viewers can decrypt and read the data, and any third parties can't. So the whole idea of encryption is that, or why it's a security measure, is because it doesn't prevent interception, but it prevents it from being understood. So it's very easy to intercept data, especially, I mean, Wi-Fi is literally going through the air, you can intercept it very easily. But if it's encrypted, you can't then understand it because it's scrambled up. So let's briefly look at the process. So first of all, you have your data written in what is known as plain text, just normal human readable text. And then an encryption algorithm will change it into ciphertext. It gets encrypted into ciphertext, which is the scramble data. And this makes no sense. The whole idea is if you intercepted this data in ciphertext, you wouldn't be able to make any sense of it. The message then gets sent across the network and is received at the other end by whoever it was meant to be received or actually the third party. If a third party receives it at this point, they don't know what to do. But the person who's meant to receive it can then decrypt it back into plain text because they effectively know the reverse of the algorithm. Or if you know the workings of this algorithm, you can then do the opposite. And it's much more complicated than that involving lots of maths, which we won't go into because it's way above this level. But the idea is that only the person who's authorized will be able to decrypt it back into plain text and so read it. Next we have firewalls, which monitor network traffic and filter packets based on set rules. So we talked about in the network videos how data is split into individual packets and so a small part of the packet is the data and then collectively it kind of um, forms the total data being sent. Well this is all about filtering these individual packets and this is a pointless image about firewalls. So the idea is they block packets or they can block packets or connections coming from certain regions. So you'll be surprised, I might have said this before, you'll be very surprised about how many connections come from slightly unexpected or dodgy places. You know, I've looked at my own traffic and it'll come from like North Korea, from China, from South America perhaps, and it's a bit, you're not quite sure why. So if you are being very careful, you might want to filter these packets out so they can't come through to your network. And uh, perhaps a misconception is that a firewall is just some software. It can be software, or it can actually be a dedicated hardware device, or embedded in routers. So your router will have a firewall probably in it, and you can also have a firewall on your computer you know, managed by your operating system. Or you can have just a dedicated firewall, maybe for a, a business. So here is the model of a packet we talked about. But we've got our actual data that comprises the, a small part of the total overall data. We've then got a header and a, a trailer. So the header is the most important in terms of between the header and trailer. The header contains information about the IP addresses and the MAC addresses. And so there are two kind of ways to there are two kind of ways a firewall will work, or two generations of firewall, I should say. So the first one filters packets just by looking at IP addresses. So it, it will have a list in it of allowed IP addresses or allowed regions, and it will compare it to the IP addresses in the header. A second generation of firewall is called stateful inspection, and this is a much more clever way of going about it. This is where they look at the context of the data. So they might go so packets are obviously sent in a sequence because the whole idea is they build up to this total data and if one packet is out of place or one packet is suspicious or doesn't make sense then it will use that and maybe filter it based on that and these are two generations modern firewalls will do loads of different methods including these two perhaps but it's more complicated than these two but these are just two ways the firewalls can work a very similar process actually is MAC address filtering and a MAC address is maybe not a term you've come across and we'll look at it very briefly. So MAC address stands, or MAC stands for Media Access Control. And this is an actual physical address embedded within a network adapter. So to connect to a network, you need a network adapter. So it could be a wireless one in this case, and every device that's connected to a network has a network adapter. And every network adapter, in turn, has their own unique MAC address. And this is unique worldwide, and you can't change it. It's hard-coded into the device. So uh, this means that MAC address filtering is, as you'd imagine, blocking or the inverse, allowing devices trying to access a network based on the MAC address. And a MAC address is used in network protocols to locate a device on an individual network. An IP address, as we've mentioned in previous videos, is about transmitting into a certain region, whereas a MAC address is much more on a local network. So instead of filtering on a particular region, this is filtering based on a specific device, I mean really a specific network adapter. So you're not even really focused on the actual device, just focused on this little adapter in your phone or on a computer. So it's not actually focused on a person or location, it's just this MAC address, which makes this a slightly weak method, but still people occasionally will use it. 
So the, uh, the issue is that if you switch devices or literally just take out this, this uh, network adapter and replace it with a new one, you're going to bypass this filtering unless you have just an, a loud list as opposed to a blocking list. Another issue is that you can quite easily fake MAC addresses um, through software and anyway eavesdropping or just packet sniffing over Wi-Fi especially the packet header contains a MAC address so you can view that and you have someone else's MAC address just by looking at it if it's not encrypted. A modern security measure comes in the form of biometric measures and biometrics as a category are just measures of human characteristics. There's a big field just focused on biometrics and in this case we're meaning them in terms of being used as identifications and access controls like fingerprint scanners, facial scanners like Apple's new face ID, eye scanners, retina scanners and voice recognition, things like this. Definitive distinctive characteristics humans have. So here's a retina scanner and here is like a, a multiple fingerprint scanner. Quite simple but obviously these are um, good measures because they're very distinctive. There are issues of all of them of course like the issue of facial ID is the fact that if you have twins then <laughs> that's uh, an issue and they're, they're prone to going wrong but these are measures you could use perhaps in combination with a password. So the more levels of identification you have the better. We also have capture which is a measure used to determine whether a user is human and you've all seen these before. They're less common now because perhaps because computers have got good enough to be able to interpret them and so only in theory only a human will be able to understand what that says and this might be there to prevent spam being sent like in order to access an email you have to go through a capture so a bot can't just send emails or spam emails also you might have a capture kind of between accessing a website so in the stage where you're clicking on a website and actually, actually use it and this might be there to prevent Website are being flooded in perhaps a denial of service attack where you repeatedly request something from a web server and it goes down. So a capture kind of prevents that from happening. And uh, as I say, these, you don't see these very often. And newer ones are picture based because the original ones could start to be read by robots. And Google actually has this recapture. This is by Google. And it's no coincidence that they have a very big AI program. So you can imagine that doing all this stuff, you know telling it what number this is and having to pick out cars and stuff like that is helping their AI system. Let's end on a similar theme to what we started with, just another list I'm afraid for the example I'd want you to know about. These are now security measures and just more of them. So first of all you could ban removal media and removal media usually just means USB devices and these can contain malware which especially if you have an autoplay feature on your computer whereby you plug in USB device in and it happens automatically they might automatically install malware being plugged in and I know uh, when I was at school you weren't allowed to plug in USB devices because you could hide like a chip in a keyboard for example obviously a USB thumb drive but there are certain I mean any USB device can be manipulated to install malware and this can obviously bypass other security measures you have like firewalls and very easy to hide the way you might protect against this is having anti-malware software scan USB ports specifically, but it's better just to ban it, I suppose. Um, a second measure you can take is any authentication, i.e. ensuring somebody or just an entity is who they say they are or are genuine, because an entity can be a, a person, it can be a product, so authentication is all about username passwords. Digital certificates, which are a little bit complicated, but these are just about verifying a website is who they say they are. Um, because they've been issued with a certificate by an, an agency that covers it and also things like product authentication if you plug a dodgy cable into your iPhone it'll be a warning message software is labelled unauthentic if you've pirated it perhaps and things like that that kind of help people determine whether stuff's genuine or not a subset of this is using email confirmations where you effectively or to some extent confirm someone's identity and at least ensuring they are an actual person as opposed to a a robot which doesn't have their own email, surprisingly. And you can also do this to include and exclude people. So, for example, like a, an educational resource might only let you have an account if your email is linked to an ACUK email address or domain on your email. Next, we have automatic software updates. Just as we mentioned, unpatched software, outdated software is a bit of an issue, so this prevents that from being an issue. And finally, we have and administrating setting constraints on passwords, having a minimum length for uppercase, lowercase, numbers, to make it a stronger password so it's, it's harder to break in a brute force attack. Also, not having default passwords. The first time you log in, having something that prompts you to change your password, perhaps, so you, not everyone 
initially has the same password, obviously that's a huge issue. So things like that which um, are there to protect against attacks.